Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening and welcome to the latest in our series of Doha debates coming to you from the Gulf state of Qatar and sponsored by the Qatar Foundation. Around the world, hundreds of millions of people live in communities where close family members marry each other. They're often called consanguineous marriages, people joined by the ties of blood. Nowhere is this more common than here in the Arab world and incidentally here in Qatar where more than 50% of marriages are between close family members. So the effects of such unions are keenly felt in this region. Much has been written about the risk, uh, increased risk of genetic disorders being passed on through marriages of this kind. But what do the experts make of it? Should such marriages continue to be sanctioned? Or is this no place for the heavy hand of the state or its medical experts to weigh in and interfere? Our motion, as usual, takes a controversial stance. This House believes that marriage between close family members should be discouraged. And we have two scientists on different sides of the argument and two other panel members who approach the issue from a social and religious standpoint. Speaking for the motion, Safraz Mansour, cultural commentator and broadcaster. His topics include British Asian identity, faith schools and social cohesion, as well as matrimonial websites among British Muslims. And with him, Ohad Burke, geneticist and head of the Genetics Institute at Soroka University Medical Center in Israel. He set up a screening program for severe genetic diseases, which has helped reduce the rate of infant mortality in Bedouin communities. Speaking against the motion, Samar Fatani, writer, columnist, and broadcaster on social issues on Saudi television. She's played an active part in social awareness campaigns, enhancing the role of women, and promoting youth empowerment. Also against the motion, Alan Bittles, who comes to the table with more than 30 years' experience studying the effects of consanguineous marriages. He's now adjunct professor at the Centre for Comparative Genomics at Murdoch University in Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our panel. So let me first ask Safraz Mansour to speak for the motion, please. Thanks, Tim. I believe cousin marriages should be discouraged because I think they're unhealthy for the couple and unwise for society. Unhealthy for the couple because of the health risks. In the UK, where I'm from, 50% of British Pakistani marriages are to the first cousin. And British Pakistanis are 13 times more likely to produce children with genetic disorders than the average. British Pakistanis account for only 3% of the British population, but they're responsible for 33% of all the children born with genetic defects. I think these are pretty scary numbers, so why do we still put up with it? I reckon it's because most of us are too scared to speak out, and it's time to stand up and say that cultural tradition isn't a good enough reason to be sticking with this practice. I mean, let's face facts, this is not a situation where two people fall in love and they just happen to be cousins. These marriages are arranged by families who want to keep wealth and property in the family, or it's a way of getting people into Britain, as in, a, in, our, in, in the country of my, my story. Um, They've got nothing to do with people getting married and everything to do with pleasing others. It's the same situation with Qatar. You've got all this money, but you've also got the greatest prevalence of obesity, diabetes, and genetic disorders in the world, and cousin marriages are the reason. I think societies are healthier when all communities mix and integrate. The more families marry within each other, the less chance of creating an integrated society. So to conclude, I am against cousin marriages because I am for human rights, for individual freedom, and for a socially integrated society. Thank you. Safraz Mansour, thank you very much indeed. In many communities around the world, you, dis you discourage close family marriage. What's the alternative? That is the only alternative available to I don't believe that that's people. true. Why, why, wish, why should it only be the person next door within your family that's the alternative? Well, because you don't get to meet other people. Well, that's about trying to create a society where actually you are allowed to meet people, where well, you are allowed to Or acknowledging the society that you live in and the safety net which the wider family provides for I'm not you. sure the safety net could be a bit of a prison, actually, because in the end, if you haven't got the freedom to be able to think about yourself and your own desires and your own happinesses, the safety net may help the community. It doesn't necessarily help the individuals Isn't concerned. Isn't that a comfortable Western view? I mean, if you're trying to put yourself in the position uh, of, of, of people here, for instance, I don't originate or elsewhere from a, in the Gulf or in some of the countries where consanguineous well, marriage heritage, is increasing. My heritage isn't from particularly from the West, so I think these are universal principles. I don't think the West has a monopoly on freedom of human rights or the individual liberty. If the mosque tells people not to uh, pay attention to the science, they're not going to listen to doctors, are they? No, they're not, and I don't think that the word of science is necessarily going to help, but what I do think is that if you can create a debate within communities, and partly through education and also through supporting people who choose 
and have the courage to break out of some of these constraints, I think that's the way to do it. I don't think legislation or science necessarily is going to be the answer. But some people would see their ties within their family and the support which families give them as almost uh, as important as their health, and in some cases much more important than their health. It's, some people it's, would it's, think, it's only in, in, in the West that the health is seen as everything, the be-all and end-all of your existence. Yeah, as I pointed out, I'm not actually using the health argument particularly. I think it's about social cohesion. In Britain, for example, you've got communities who, if they're marrying within each other, they're not facing the wider society, and therefore they're having a danger of being more retrenched and, more having, and basically having effective segregation. The World Health Organization says don't discourage this. You're going to put yourself against the World Health Organization. I think there's a lot of political sensitivity about this sort of stuff. And I think they say actually, sensitivity. Political sensitivity, yeah. Yes. Because, and, and the reason for that They're is... They're being sensitive to other people's demands, other people's politics, well, you could say that. You could other say people's traditions. Sensitive could be another word for saying scared. I would say that they might be being scared because there's a danger that actually something which is actually common sense is loaded with the political... Um, baggage. So actually, it's completely, you know, it's completely common sense that there are more people in the world you can marry than your cousin, but maybe the, w Health, uh, the WHO can't say that because right. of okay. uh, the number of members who are part of it. All right, Safraz Mansour, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now could I ask please Sama Fatani to speak against the motion? Well, I, um, first of all, I'd like to differentiate between um, the, uh, the British uh, uh, Muslim community in, in uh, in Britain and the Arab world. It's a different uh, setup here. Um, in our part of the world, um, you cannot discourage it simply because there are religious and cultural reasons. So in principle, uh, you cannot um, ask or discourage a Muslim from wanting to do something that is permitted by God. Um, uh, culturally, uh, the, the lifestyle here, uh, they, you know, there's a lot of respect for, for the family. Uh, uh, families uh, kind of feel comfortable if the daughters marry within the family rather than uh, marry a stranger um, with no background. They don't, they're not sure whether she's going to be happy, safe and what not. Um, at the same time, the segregated lifestyle uh, it doesn't allow for the mixing of sexes except within the family environment. So you usually have, you know, the cousins falling in love and parents will not stand in the way of love and, and, and um, having, feeling comfortable that she's, um, the, the daughter is marrying within the family. Um, also, um, uh, the, the only thing that we can do to discourage it, and I think in Qatar and Saudi Arabia is the same, uh, you, uh, it is uh, uh, compulsory to have um, a medical uh, uh, blood test before getting married to make sure. The only thing that would discourage such a marriage is if there is um, uh, a chronic uh, hereditary disease within the family. And when that happens, usually within, um, I mean, the educated middle class, so if they're aware of the fact, I don't think um, the couple would want to go through, through the marriage. You know, there are many reasons, and at the same time, uh, you know, people uh, kind of uh, feel um, that it is good for the society, um, it, is, uh, it helps the family have stronger ties, we're very proud of the fact that we have the extended family lifestyle. It is something that we would not want to lose. So there are so many reasons. Um, and, and the if you fact could come to a close, please. Sure. Um, the fact that uh, maybe sometimes um, in other parts of the world, they feel that the girls are being forced into this marriage. It's an arranged marriage, and she doesn't want to do it. It's the parents who make her want to do it, okay. but it's not the case. Sama Fatani, thank you very much indeed. You seem to suggest that medical tests Testing is sufficient. I want to draw your attention to what uh, specialist geneticist at the Shafala Special Needs Center here in Qatar said. He said there's no counseling to help people make decisions, and even if the results show one or both of the parents to be a carrier, the attitude is usually, well, carry on regardless, everything will be okay, inshallah. Is that, is that the uh, attitude that you're promoting? I'm not promoting, not at all. As I said, I mean, with education and uh, people are m m health conscious at, uh, today, I don't think... But it's not working, couple. is it? I mean, it's not working. It if is. people Maybe. are saying, uh, carrying on regardless, they get the information. I, d I don't think this is the case with uh, people who are educated and realise the consequences. Uh, of well, this is the view from pretty well-established, pretty respected geneticists here in Qatar at the Special Needs Centre. 
Father Special Needs Centre. I still have my doubts. Your argument also that you cannot uh, discourage something which is permitted by religion. There is a body of opinion in Islam that doesn't agree with you at all. There is a, a quote from the Prophet Muhammad that says, marry those who are unrelated to you so that your children do not become weak. Exactly. No. We check no. this with an Islamic scholar. He says this is a hadith, this is a saying of the Prophet. I, and if there is scientific fact to support it, then that makes it stronger and it should be followed. But I did say the only thing that would discourage such a marriage if, is if there is an absolute fact that there is a hereditary disease within that family. Most families who have a mental disease or maybe thalassemia or that sort of disease that is chronic and it's hereditary are always discouraged from you know, uh, going into this marriage. But not when there is no absolute proof that there is So, the, so there is disease. some discouragement which is possible, there is some hereditary. official discouragement. Yes. When is it acceptable to be discouraged by a professional? I mean, we're discouraged from doing lots of things in life, by our teachers, by our family. Where do you draw the line here? When medical tests prove that there is a hereditary disease and your, your offspring will have that kind of uh, uh, problem, abnormality. All right, Sama Fatani, thank you very much indeed. Now could I please ask Ohad Burke to speak for the motion. Good evening. I'll go back to basic genetics. So every human being has thousands of genes. For most genes, we have two copies, one from our father, one from our mother. We all have mutations in some of our genes. However, we're lucky that many genetic diseases occur only when one gets both mutated copies. Now, if I have a bad copy of a gene and I marry outside the family, the chances that my wife brings in the same bad copy of the same gene are very small. However, if I marry my first cousin, the chances that she inherited the same bad copy from our common grandparent are much higher. Statistics show that worldwide, the chances of having a child with a severe birth defect are around 3%. In first cousin marriages, it goes up to 6 to 7%. And in fact, if marriages in the family have been going on for generations, it goes up to 10% and more. Over the past decade, I've been serving our Bedouin community of some 200 people, 200,000 people. And uh, in this community, 60% marry their first or second cousins. Accordingly, the incidence of severe birth defects are four times higher than in other communities. We arranged a very uh, extensive program of both research followed by genetic testing, and it was very successful, but only to a limit. At the end, it's human beings. Two days ago, a couple came into my office with their two bright, beautiful girls, both born with no eyes, no eyeballs. This couple is devastated. Last week, I visited the home of a, a family. He's a, a high school teacher, and three of his kids, ages 23, 20, and 18, are in diapers, severely mentally retarded, don't recognize their parents. These families send a very clear message. Marry within your community, Marry even within your remote family, but do not marry your first cousin. Oh, Head Burke, thank you very much indeed. Do you want a nanny state where the state interferes in all aspects of your life, takes away one more aspect of your freedom of, delivers you want, your freedom for maneuver, your freedom to make decisions about your own fate? In genetics, in clinical genetics, it's Non-directive genetic counseling, that's the basis. We allow and direct everyone to make their choices. People should know, but then they should make their own choices. That's not discouraging. You're advocating discourage. Who's, who's to do the discouraging? It's up to the community. And how strong should this be, this discouragement? Not legal. It won't work in a legal way. It's people that need to make their decision. They either take a huge risk or they don't take a huge risk. You know, you can marry your third or fourth Life cousin. Life is full of risks, they will tell you. Yes, but God, if you... God will decide. Look, That's I, what many I people know say. hundreds of families. They are... I, I, when you see people that have a very sick child, when it goes down to the next pregnancy, people have abortions, though it's horrible. Early on in Islam, uh, early on in pregnancy, it's allowed, but it's a very hard choice. And you see mothers doing that because it's, it's, it's such huge suffering. So why not the marry our race third? race continues to survive when many yeah, but people you're a have family. been going on with this practice for centuries. Right, but you're a family and you know, marry your third or fourth cousin and why, why go through that? It's just 
huge suffering. I, you know, it's not my why problem. Why be interfered with problem. by doctors? Why have somebody breathing down your neck and trying to upset the traditions that have underpinned your society no, for centuries? No need for interference by doctors. Doctors should supply the information. The choices should be made by the people. By the people. And who's to interpret the information for the people? The scientific information by scientists and by physicians, the implications by the family. And each family should decide whether they want to take the risk or not. But they should know that it's a huge risk. OK. Oh, Hedberg, thank you very much indeed. Alan Bittles, could I ask you to speak against the motion, please? Yes. I, I'm, before I say anything else, I'm intrigued by the fact that the two colleagues on the right-hand side seem to differ in their risk rates. We had Safraz talking about 13 times higher risk rate of genetic disease. 33% of all cases in Britain of genetic disease were in the 3% of people who are Pakistani. Whereas Ohad is saying it's 6 to 7 percent. Well, that's a big difference. And I think part of the problem is, although you eschewed the role of science and said you weren't taking a scientific stance, you were in quoting these statistics, which I think are totally spurious. I don't know where you got them from. I will give you some statistics now. They are based on 5 million births, on 75 studies from around the world. The risk of excess stillbirths in first cousin offspring is 0.5 per thousand. Infant deaths, 12.5 per thousand. Deaths from late pregnancy through to 10 to 12 years, that would be 34 per thousand. We're not talking 33%. These are ludicrous figures. So you do yourself no service, and you do the case you're trying to make no service by quoting figures of that nature. So really, what I want to know is, and Ohad has said, it's OK to marry within the clan, within the community, because, of course, if you don't marry your first cousin, you're going to marry within the clan, or you're going to marry within the community. And the degree to which you will reduce the risk of genetic disease is actually quite limited. And if we are going to take this idea that we will discourage, in parenthesis, people from marrying close kin, who is actually going to monitor this? Who is going to run it? Under what situations will it be applied? Will it be mandatory? Will it be voluntary? If someone opts out and says, no, I don't want any part of this, are we going to take some stance against that? And we really need to know this thing because as a medical geneticist of 30, 40 years standing, I am well aware of the difficulties that have been in the past as a result of misuse of genetics. The early part of the 20th century, literally hundreds of thousands of people were murdered or sterilized on eugenic grounds. Could you come to a close, please? I will close at that point in time. I think we've got to be very careful what may appear to be a reasonable stance, and I'm sure in the hands of reasonable people is a reasonable stance, can turn out to be a monster that you've created okay. to all our problems. Alan Bittles, thank you very much indeed. You're unusually reticent for a doctor. Most of them are pretty forthright in telling us what we can do, what we can eat, what we can't eat, what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat what kind of sex we should practice, this sort of thing. You are unusually reticent. Why? Over I'm, this. I'm a reticent sort of guy. Where, where, you know, where, not, where the I'm lives, not to say to people, where the you quality, must do this Where the observe. quality of life of children is concerned, you want to suddenly step back Certainly. from the role that doctors are increasingly assuming, which is to tell us how we should live every moment of our lives. And you're accusing me of this. One, on one hand, you're saying, I'm why, why are you not doing back. it? Why are you not? I'm because, wondering why you're stepping back here. Because when I started this work, I started from a background. My background is in Northern Ireland. And I thought the idea of going out with one's cousin or marrying a cousin was absolutely ludicrous. This was scandalous and would inevitably be harmful. The work that I've been doing over the last 30, 40 years has convinced me that the problems that accrue from consanguineous marriage by comparison with the actual social benefits, particularly it must be stressed, the social benefits to females. But you, but you don't dispute the risks of deformity that increase with first cousin marriage, do you? Oh, certainly not. I mean, in terms of birth defects, this is something you said in, in 2008, in terms of birth defects, the risks rise from about 2% in the general population to 4% when parents are closely related. You'd stand by that? I would stand by that, absolutely. So this I is an increased risk? An increased risk. Put in and in general, context. people should be encouraged not to take increased risk. Abs We're asking for a red traffic light.
Absolutely. Uh, at, 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 at the junction. You're the red traffic light guy. I'm the amber guy. You know, I might give a warning signal going up, but you've got to put that extra 2 to 4% warning isn't in the a context discouragement? of four children in a warning family. Warning isn't a discouragement. How do you explain to someone you're going to have four children, you have an increased risk of 2 to 4%? What does 2 to 4% mean? It's, a, it's four double. Children? It's double. It's double. From 2 to 4, that's double the risk. So if what, you're going from what? You're going to have all four children affected as opposed to two children? You're going to Come minimise risk wherever you can. Alan Biddles, thank you very much indeed. We are now going to throw it open to the questions from the floor. Our motion is this House believes that marriage between close family members should be discouraged. I'm going to take your questions. Gentleman in the front row. Um, Suleiman Rawahi from Sultanate of Oman. Um, my question is for this side, uh, who is for the motion. Um, how can we be like 100% Guaranteed that if we are doing the test, um, that no results will happen in the future. And uh, if we don't do the test and get married to um, a lady from outside my family, how can I be also 100% guaranteed that I will not get an effect from that? Go ahead, Buck. Okay, so, so genetic testing is very important, very crucial, but has its limitations, especially in first cousin marriages. First cousin marriages, you can have two types of diseases, diseases that are common in that community, and these will be tested for if you have a good screening pro program. However, there are also genetic diseases that are unique to your family, and no way that a screening program will find them. So if people think, oh, I did the testing and I'm fine, well, do the testing. It's important, but it will find only part of the diseases. Now, if you, if you marry your third or fourth cousin, what you will have in common are diseases that are much more common and that will be screened for by the genetic screening. So if you marry your third or fourth cousin, first of all, you dramatically reduce the risk of a genetic disease. But, nothing, but nothing's foolproof. And no, and okay, Alan Bittles, I want to bring you in. Testing is much more effective then. I would agree absolutely with what I had to say, but of course, what he has failed to say um, is that the risks which accrue from first cousin marriage really concentrate on otherwise very rare diseases. When diseases are common in the gene pool, as with sickle cell disease or thalassemia, which you may be tested for in Oman, then the risk, the added risk of being a first cousin marriage to that of the general population is actually quite low. So I, these rare diseases I, really only m affect first cousin marriages. I, I, I have to go in here. Look, I've been dealing with Arab Bedouin genetics for a decade on a daily clinical basis. And the numbers in textbooks talk about 6%. In real life, it's much higher than that because it's not first cousin marriages that you have in the statistics. It's been going on in that family for generations. And what you see is specific diseases for families that have much higher percentages than textbooks. And, and it's not I marry for the first time my first cousin. It's very different. This is inbreeding for generations. It's not a first time cousin marrying a cousin. Okay, I'm gonna take a question from the gentleman in the second row there. Um, thank you, I'm from Afghanistan and I have a question from Ms. Uh, Samar. Discouraging uh, family marriages also suggest fundamental social reforms as Manzur suggested. Don't you believe that um, Estates in this part of the world are also afraid of bringing such fundamental uh, reforms, such as mixing uh, work areas or education system, in order to promote um, uh, diverse uh, marriages. Don't you believe the states are afraid of uh, some radical movements or some radical Islamic institutions uh, against those uh, reforms? Sama Fatani. Well, I, I don't think so. I think, as I said, it's the lifestyle, it's the culture. People are comfortable about that. I don't think it has to do with the state or with, with medical tests or with... I think it's important. Um, I agree with, with what the specialists say. We need to have an uh, you know, uh, awareness. We need to tell them the risks that they're taking. We need to have medical checkups. There should be a major campaign um, on radio, television to show what the risks that they're going to uh, you know, um, uh, endure. But at the same time, it's the extended family 
family lifestyle, people feel comfortable to have the extended family, to marry within the family. It sounds like a sort of a radical idea, but don't people partly get married to get away from their families? Really? <laughs> Well, I tell you, most of the girls, especially at this part of the world, I mean, my, my parents were cousins and my, my brother's married to his cousin. Um, uh, some families feel kind of offended um, if, uh, if like a graduate uh, uh, in the family just came home and um, there's so many pretty girls in the family and he decides to marry outside the family. It, it's not, you know, it's frowned upon. Um, most of the girls um, would want to feel comfortable to be married if there are nice boys in the family. She would rather do that yeah, rather than marry me, someone your whole, your whole argument. Well, we might so ask some of the uh, ladies in the audience whether they agree with you on right. that one. We'll hear from you and then we'll come back to the question. I'm a Canadian student at the American University of Paris. And we're talking, uh, we talked a little bit about women's rights, but um, isn't this really an exchange of women, and isn't this a way of owning their reproductive rights? No, uh, she's in love with her cousin and she wants to get married to him. Where, where is that against human rights? She's not forced into that marriage. She's willingly getting into the marriage. Can you guarantee that she's not being pressured into this? Then it's another story. I mean, we're not discussing, you know, that's another issue. We're talking about people who willingly and, you know, lovingly want to be part of the family. And in large numbers here in Qatar, it's, for instance, are, are getting out of those marriages as well. Well, I mean... Willingly and lovingly. That they so, it, it that they so lovingly I mean, the went rate, into. The divorce rate is high all over the world. I don't think it had to do with that. <laughs> I'm going back to the questioner here. Well, she just said that it's, I think it's very simplistic to bring the love issues because I believe that a state does play a very important role in, mar in marriage contracts, especially in this region. If you're saying that this, a state is not involved, then why isn't the state allowing uh, cross-cultural marriages or, or maybe um, expats marriages with the locals? So don't you believe that the state actually is playing that? The state here? never, there's no ban on marrying uh, outside. Uh, there is no ban. The only thing is you need to have permission. And I, I guess this is for security reasons. It has nothing to do with any banning. OK, lady up there with your hand up. Hello, everyone. My name is Salma Haider. I'm from Sudan. I would say I'm uh, living uh, evidence that um, a cousin's marriage doesn't work. I come from a family with a history of uh, first cousin married. Um, my, my parents are first cousins. And my aunt also had a, she got married to her cousin. Uh, she had two child. Uh, both of them died early in their life, and they had um, very dangerous hereditary diseases, and uh, they actually suffered in their lives. And um, we, um, my question is the side uh, againist. Uh, what I'm saying uh, that I'm now afraid of how much uh, I'm afraid of the time, like how, when I get into my 40s or my 50s, I'll get diabetes because everyone in my family has diabetes and other than that um i think it's not about like a girl looking at her cousin and thinking how what good qualities he has you as a female has many responsibilities and you have to think about your kids so i would think that's more appropriate thing of and cousins marriage also have many problems from the social side and people get divorced because they can have more children that are, have uh, pro uh, problems like health problems and even like mental problems. So I don't think there is something that could be good uh, coming out of it. Thank you. Sama Fatani, don't you have a responsibility listening to that story right. to take a stand against if I, if first I, cousin sure. marriage? If you, I was, you see the results. Sure. If I was a member of a family that had uh, you know, hereditary disease, I would certainly not encourage my children or, or any member of the family to be married. But we're talking about healthy families. We're talking about families who do not have a hereditary disease like diabetes or sickle cell uh, thalassemia or whatever uh, mental disease, a normal family with no hereditary disease. If I knew that in my family I have a hereditary disease like heart disease or whatever, I would definitely discourage it, but I, I would not daily. apply you know, collective guilt. Very yeah. often you don't see it, you don't know it, and you are the first one that it shows up, and then 
Well, next it could year, happen it's to in, you your, if you're a in, in two or three of your cousins, and in this generation, suddenly, oops, it shows up. And, and we see it again and again. And, and people come in with three or four diseases in the same family. It's, it, Are you trying to tell me that, I, only, I that only the families, the the, her the Families who marry within each other are the only ones who get any kind of disease? I mean, no, diseases are all they, over the world. No, Why but should the it be that... Uh, Can he, the uh, let him answer your point. Sure. The, the incidence is much higher, and we see it, and, and trust me, it, it's... When I'm here, I'm not here. It's, it's not me. It's families sending me here. And, and, and people are promising that their kids will not marry their first cousins. I mean, you say it's statistics. It's not statistics. It's real human beings. And, and if you fall in these statistics, your life is destroyed, the entire family, not just this child. If I had the choice, and um, I knew a person who wanted to marry me, and I knew that in his family he has a mental problem, the family has mental problems, I would not get into that. He's not a cousin, but I still would want, not want to do it. Okay. So um, it has nothing to do with cousins. Okay. The gentleman in the front row. Hi. Uh, Badr al from Sultanat of Oman. I'm going to change the subject. Um, I don't have a particular question for... Um, a particular member of the panel, anybody can answer it. It's about the premarital uh, screening tests. We live, uh, I'm talking about the Gulf society, it's a very sensitive, a very fragile society. What are the effects of the test if it really shows that this lady or this gentleman has a genetic disorder in his genes? Um, they will not get married. They will not get married at all. <laughs> Good question. Right? Okay, Alan, I'll, I'll, Alan Biddles, do you want to take that yes. first? Yes, unfortunately, what you tend to find is that at least half of the people who have the tests and show that they are both carriers proceed with marriage anyway. So this, this is the a situation. The problem is the society doesn't understand it that way. Uh, maybe um, I'll... You need to make the society understand, okay, those two couples are not compatible. That's not how the society understands it. The society understands it this way. This girl has a problem. Don't touch her. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll... Go ahead, Bert. Okay, I'll... Go ahead, Bert. Okay. We're, we're dealing with that daily, and we have solutions for that, and it works. So... When a girl gets tested, she and her father or parents get the answer. The other side does not get the answer. And we have cases that people try to trick us. A guy came in where I'm flying tomorrow, I want to have her results. No way, he will not get her result. And, and we have ways of keeping the information very tremendously Even private. so, the, the society will question why that marriage did not happen. If she marries someone of another family that has another disease, they're both fine. The kids will have not this disease and not that disease. So, and, and mainly, we have ways of doing it so that the information is kept totally private. And there are ways of doing it in medicine. There, there are perfect ways of You're doing it. You happy with that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> OK, all right, gentlemen in the third row. My question is for Mr. Ahad. I've read from many articles that actually um, consanguineous marriages increases the uh, fertility rate. So why would uh, we discourage um, car uh, cousins to marry when it actually increases their fertility rate and to bring children to the world? Okay, so, so first of all, there are studies showing that consanguineous marriages have on average higher number of kids. Most studies claim it's cultural. So these many of these couples marry at an earlier age and have more kids. But the numbers are very interesting. If you look from so Iceland... So fertility is because they're younger? Most. Is this what but, but even if not, if you look at the numbers, you see, and, and there's a very nice paper on science from 2008, the kids that are born, on average, live, have a lower uh, life expectancy, have a much lower rate of having offspring, so the number of grandchildren is lower. So in a way, you can either marry your third cousin and have eight kids, or marry your first cousin, have 10 kids, have two of them suffer and die, and then you end up with eight kids. So I, I, I'm putting it you know, to the extreme, but yes, there is higher fertility rates, but 
lower life expectancy and lower fertility in the coming generation. Alan Bittles, do you want to come in on that? What I'd say, you're taking the, to the extreme. Why change the habit of a lifetime? Because you've been doing it all evening. Um, that study, I know the study very well because I know the people who did the study in Iceland. And yes, you're correct in what you say. There is, an, on average, higher fertility. It is certainly associated with the younger age at marriage and the younger age at which you have your first child and the elongation of the reproductive span. And in some cases, it may also be due to reproductive compensation for a child dying early. But in general, what you say is correct. So I, was, I just want to ask you. want to come back just yeah. briefly? Just, uh, so a lot of people also have miscarriages. But well, when carriages and cousin marriages, there's higher fertility rate. Where uh, and there's other uh, non consecutive uh, marriages where there's a chance where there could be miscarriage, like the, the female the carry holder could have a miscarriage. And so maybe it's better for cousins to get married so that they can increase the rate, uh, the chances of getting a, uh, bringing a baby to this earth. I don't follow the logic. I, uh, there's. I think the I, logic I, is uh, a little bit uh, <laughs> tortuous, shall we say. But in fact, <laughs> the rates of miscarriages and uh, spontaneous abortions are lower in first cousin marriages than in non consanguineous marriages. That's what the data would say in two thirds of the studies that we actually conducted. OK, I'm going to move to a lady in the third row there. Thank you. My name is Noor Al Malki from Qatar. Uh, in Qatar, you, we, uh, in our part of uh, uh, the world, we have uh, maybe something unique. People would uh, go into marriage but not consummated. It. It's during this period of engagement. Uh, legally, it would be marriage, but it's not consummated. And in our region, we have a lot of people, for instance, 50% uh, who get into this engagement, legal marriage so, uh, sort of thing, they break it up before consummation. So this distorts the statistics of marriage. We know about this in Qatar, and this is one of the problems we're facing. Where do you stand on the motion, if we can ask? Uh, I'm with the motion, but I would go with uh, uh, media campaigns to inform people, but I'm with the motion. Media campaigns to discourage? Yes. But not close family marriage. No legal intervention. No legal intervention. Just we need to inform people, and we need to do a lot of work in this respect. And is that likely to happen, do you think? Uh, yes, yes, I think so. And we need to uh, 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 bet on the educated uh, uh, younger generation to change this, uh, uh, this phenomena in our part of the world. OK, Thank lady you. in the second row there. Hi, my name is Khawla Uthman. Uh, I'm from UAE. Uh, my question is for the side which uh, agrees with discouraging marriages between relatives. Um, do you think that uh, by discouraging the, uh, the, uh, the inter-family marriages, that could lead to an increase of number of un unmarried uh, women? As we know, in the Gulf region, the marriages between relatives are about 50%. So if you are encouraging that um, people should marry, uh, that men should marry a woman from outside their family or even from other countries, what would happen to the 50% of women who are from the country itself? They will remain unmarried. Thank you. Why is it only the men that you're talking about then? Because, because they have like more options. They can, they can ha go and have like marry a woman from outside and their kids will have the, uh, will still, ha will still have the, uh, their passport, like it will be, they will be local from, Emora from Emirates. Whereas the, whereas the woman in the, uh, in the UAE, they want to marry Emirati men because they want their kids to be Emirati. I mean, I think that I can imagine that being initially a problem because if, they, if, if you have any kind of change and if anything like this change happened, then there w I think there would be such problems. But in a way, I would say that that's possibly a price worth paying a bit further down the line because actually if those women are getting married in marriages which are you know, potentially not going to be necessarily good for their children, maybe not necessarily ones that they actually wanted, maybe this is a battle you have to fight and then eventually you win the war. But perhaps... I, I can tell you that we're, we have educational programs going for more than a decade, and we're seeing the change only in the last two or three years, and things work. People may get married, not within the very close family. That's why I'm saying not out of the family, so they marry within the family, but further away. And, you wanted and to come back. Yes, but what about like from the 50% of the marriages between families, maybe these, uh, um, these marriages won't have like negative effects on their kids 
they won't there won't be any disorder for their kids why do you uh, discourage marriage if there won't be any future disease or disorders for their kids are you saying if there's no dangers yes, of, if there's of there no being danger, any genetic? Well, why I'm, not, do you I'm not a geneticist, so that, in that sense, I'm not, I'll defer to you yes. on that. I actually just think society is better. My question is more about society. I just think societies are better when people mix with wider communities than just their own family. That's my, my basic view. Is I just think that even if these, you know, the statistics that you're saying, even if despite the health things, I just think it's better to get to know other families and other communities rather than just sort of stewing in your own pot. Okay, there's a lady up there who's had a hand up for a long time. She's actually supporting it with the other hand. <laughs> yes, you. Hi, I'm from Pakistan. I'm married to a British Pakistani. Um, he's not my first cousin. Um, I think the gentleman for the motion especially the British Pakistani, you're confusing the issue with forced marriages, because that's the issue with British Pakistani community there, as opposed to discouraging them to get married within their families. The other point I'd like to make is, there are four people who are very, very close to me, four couples, they all have children with disabilities. Only one couple are actually related to each other. The other three aren't. So to me, these statistics, it just seems like, you know, statistics are being, um, they're just floating around and it can happen to anyone, really. Uh, can I just respond? Yes, please. Um, yes. Firstly, my name's Safraz. Um, secondly, uh, the, the, you're talking about forced. Um, I think the word forced is quite a blurry word when it comes to communities and families. So for example, when I was 17, I was, my, my dad suggested that it might be a good idea for me to marry my cousin even though she lived in a village in, in Pakistan and had no idea about any of the films, books, or music that I was interested in. There was no force, but there was a process where he didn't talk to me for quite a while. When I got to my early 30s, again, it was suggested that it might be a nice idea for somebody from back in the village and outside Lahore to marry. Again, it wasn't forced, but my mum told me she'd kill herself if I didn't. So there's still... <laughs> so, just a little pressure. Well, well, there's a little bit a of pressure, so yeah, I think the word forced is it's a very male. flexible, elastic word. Yeah, but that Could is... I just asked, did your mother kill herself? <laughs> um, luckily, she didn't, but only... Eventually well, then why raise the point? Well, you know, I'll tell you why. It gets a ready laugh, no, 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 but no, no, come on, me. let's relax I'll on this one. I'll tell you why, I'll tell you Really, <laughs> you're too much the joker. <laughs> <laughs> this is a serious <laughs> subject. Let's treat it with if respect. If I'm a joker, I think you're a bit of an actor, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, back. Let's go back to the question. Just, just very quickly, I think that, that um, amounts to emotional blackmail, which actually is, in effect, you know, forcing you to make a decision, a life decision. So that is the issue within the British Pakistani communities, not so much that we need to discourage them, because I don't think... I'm not in favour of cousin marriages, but I don't think it's um, you know, up to any one of us to tell others what to do. OK, gentlemen in the front row. Uh, I'm from Egypt, and my question is, it, well, I'm not going to start with a little preface to the question. I think at this point, the entire debate boiled down to that both sides agree there's no dispute against the science that marrying your first cousin will increase your chances of disease. But that's not the issue at hand anymore. The issue at hand is that term, discourage. Discourage is a very strong word, and it implies taking action against something. So, for example, if I want to discourage my son from smoking, I'm not going to give him pocket money. That's discouragement. It implies taking action. And the question that we should be asking right now, or the question I'm going to ask the panel to focus more on, is what are the parameters of this discouragement? What is discouragement? Some suggested using media campaigns. Some suggested simply informing people. But where do you draw the line where discouragement becomes infringement upon people's freedoms? OK. I, I, the, the basic idea is complete free choice. No doubt, I think, of anyone in the panel, that should be the limit, okay? Complete free choice. Having people know their choices, what's for, what's against, and make their choices. But people need to know. And then it's up to them. Take your risk. Alan Fine. Bittles. I agree very strongly with what you say, and this was a point I was trying to raise originally. Um, once you start a process of discouragement, in parenthesis, where does it end? And especially in a society or in societies where there isn't the requisite scientific personnel or medical personnel or genetic counselors to actually provide information in a dispassionate and unbiased manner, 
then you are going to have difficulties. Something is going to go wrong with the system, and once the system is in play, it can really go out of kilter very, very seriously. Okay, we're going to go in a moment to the vote, but before we do, I'd like to just ask each of the panelists for one sentence, crystallizing their views, and we're going to go around in a semicircle and start with you, Safras. Just, just one uh, just sentence. Just in a sentence, please. you can't force people, but you can encourage them, and I, because I believe in human rights, freedom and a better, more integrated and happier society where it's the individual that matters and not the family, I think we should support the motion. Go ahead, Mark. Well, marry within your community, keep your culture, do genetic testing, it's important, but do not marry your first cousin. And I see the suffering in families daily. It's much too much. Okay, yeah. Alan Biddles. Humans have been marrying first cousins and even closer for literally thousands of years. We started with 700 to 10,000 people leaving Africa. We now number 5.8 billion. If cousin marriage, One cousin sentence. mating had been all that problematic, we wouldn't be here today. I believe that awareness campaigns and education can help this problem. And uh, once people are aware that there is a problem, it will not be a problem anymore. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to vote on the motion. This House believes marriage between close family members should be discouraged. If you'll just take your voting machines, I'll explain to you how they work. If you want to vote for the motion, that is the side represented by those on my right, in a moment you're going to need press button one. If you want to vote against the motion, the side represented by those on my left, it will be button two. Whichever button you want to press, please do it now. Okay, there we are. That's the result. 81% for the motion, 19% against. The motion has been resoundingly carried. All that it remains for me to do is to thank our distinguished panellists. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you to you, the audience. The Doha Debates will be back again in a month's time. Till then, from all of us on the team, have a safe journey home. Thanks for coming. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.